good food. All right. Um, let's begin with prayer. I was telling Marcia that when you go to SBL, the Society of Biblical Literature, you don't hear people teaching, certainly not preaching. People come and they read to you. So they read their papers. So they could just they could just hand them to you and you could go back to your room and get a drink and read them. But obviously it's for the purpose of question and answer and there are sometimes panels. So tonight I'm going to be working off of what I wrote out here because this is a kind of a turning point in the epistle where we're getting some very foundational information that informs the rest of the epistle as well as sort of how Paul thinks about the history of redemption. And what's true here in Galatians 3 obviously is applicable to the rest of Galatians, but if you were to take some of the basic ideas and carry them over to Romans, it would shed a lot of light on traditional difficult passages in Romans, um, particularly difficult for Protestant people. Um, there's, so in other words, our little passage here opens up possibilities for interpreting Romans as well as Galatians. Barry, I'm going to have to, I'll mute you, okay? Is that my wife? Yeah. Yeah, she's just... <coughs> All right, so let's begin with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word and your wisdom and power on display in the story of redemption, that you worked in very real history among very real people, to accomplish your very real purpose to save a people for yourself and to provide them with an everlasting homeland purchased through the sacrificial death of your son and his shed blood. And we receive all of this richness and blessing through faith and in turn give you glory as we are admirers of the work of redemption and how it seemed at many different turns along the way your purposes could have been thwarted and yet your singular purpose ran through to completion and to the praise of your glorious grace. Now grant us, we pray tonight, wisdom and insight as we study your word and may it be a blessing to us for we ask this through Christ. Amen. Okay, just again to hold context together. These aren't bits and pieces that Paul's putting together. He's got a flow of thought that goes all the way back to the, the incident at Antioch and chapter 2 verse 16 where he juxtaposes justification by faith versus works of the law. The argument proper gets underway in Galatians 3. So by way of summary, how, Paul asked the Galatians in 3, 1 through 5, did they receive the eschatological Holy Spirit? Did they receive him? There's a nod to uh, Nicaea. He is fully divine. He, did they receive him and experience all that they experienced from him by works of namas or by hearing with faith. These two options establish the starting point for Paul's argument in Galatians 3, 6 through 14, in which 3, 14 provides a summarizing conclusion that also serves as, you, as the right doctrine that the Galatians must embrace. Please note that Galatians 3.14 is not about justification by faith alone, but it does assume 
justification by faith alone, which was indispensable to the Galatians. Here's a great sentence. It's pregnant with meaning to the Galatians eschatological placement into Abraham's family. And here is how I charted the order in which Paul's argument unfolds, bridging that opening question to the passage we're going to look at tonight. So it's really faith versus works of the namas. So going the left side has the verses. Abraham's righteousness was by faith. Abraham's true sons share his faith. The Gentiles would be justified by faith. But the gospel means that the Gentiles are a blessed people with faith uh, and are blessed with Abraham. I don't know if I said that the way I wanted to. Sometimes you edit around and it leave things in needlessly, but the Gentiles are a blessed people and they share blessing with Abraham, also someone with faith. Now blessing is juxtaposed to what Israel's covenant offered, namely curse. Well, there was blessing and curse in the terms of the covenant, but given Israel's behavior, they were always under the curse threat. And so Paul retrospectively looks at the works of the Namas, and he says, Namas put Israel under a curse. Namas requires doing as opposed to believing. Namas does not justify anyone. Namas is not of faith. It requires doing. Christ redeemed us from Namas' curse by becoming a curse for us. And for some reason, I seem to have dropped out the little um, passage from Habakkuk, which was in my original table. Um, but you know that's there. So here's where we are. The Gentiles receive Abraham's blessing and the promised spirit is received through faith. So the gospel that was preached beforehand to Abraham depended on the Gentiles being justified by faith, but that gospel's actual content, at least in this context, is what you see at the bottom of the right-hand column. Abraham's blessing and the promised Holy Spirit. The promised Holy Spirit is a bit of a mystery sitting there all by itself. That sounded cool. Was that your, just something went cling right on, oh, that was good. Can, it's like in Catholic mass, you know, when they ring the bell. Um, so we're going to have to postpone our discussion of exactly what the gift of the spirit meant for the Galatians, but we do know that his presence in the church was evident in the miracles that he performed and so forth. Okay? So, now it is time for Paul to introduce the word promise, which will join faith as a defining feature of Abraham's blessing, land, and the covenant that sealed it. But we must note this, and this is very important. If we pause for a moment at the end of 314, we have to realize that Paul just reinterpreted the story of Israel. This is an amazing thing that he's done, and he never would have done it if Jesus Christ had not surprisingly been crucified by the Romans, only to be raised from the dead, and then from his heavenly reign, confront Paul on the road to Damascus. So now, Paul has, in a sense, 
a key to take all this extraordinary amount of information that he has stuffed away in his mind that is the story of Israel and he makes a crucial adjustment so that he's thinking about it not just in a new way but the way that it should have been thought about all along. But it's the death and resurrection of the Messiah that's confirmed it for him. Here's how he used to read it. And believe me, this is a very simplistic account. Um, but I think it gets the point across. Step one, thinking of this same story, God promised Abram a family and a land, and he sealed that promise with a covenant. Step two, sort of jumping over, you know, circumcision in chapter 17 of Galatians. God rescued Abraham's family from Egypt, gave them his Torah at Mount Sinai, then led them into the land that he promised to Abram. Fulfillment, right? The text tells us on many different occasions that this is the fulfillment of promises made. Step three, jumping way ahead, sort of past the prophets, was associated with the age to come, that a purified Israel, where everyone was like a Pharisee. And not like Christians use the word Pharisee, but as Paul considered himself and those who shared his zeal for Judaism, that kind of Pharisee. A purified Israel, uh, where everyone was like a Pharisee, living in the land under the Torah. And then God would be the king again over them, and they would have received all those promises that the prophets had made. The end. Credits roll. Okay? Does that sound fair? Again, it's, it's a Sunday school version, but it's a, a brief way of sort of peeking into how Paul and others like him would have read the story of God's people. So, obviously, if you've spent any time here, you know there's much more to the age to come than that little summary of it. But take note of what is essential to it. Abraham's purified descendants live in that land, meaning those who are, in some way or another, genetically connected to him. Okay, Children of Abraham in the family tree ancestry.com sense. They would live in the land that God promised what does it go from the Euphrates River to the Nile, I think, in Genesis 15? And they would live under the Torah, which, of course, was God's eternal law, which distinguished them from all the nations of the earth. Isn't that nice? Okay, so in a, just a very brief and, and simplistic way, we have a sense of how Paul would have thought about the story of his own people. Tara, did I see a hand? Well, actually, I don't see a hand because it's missing. Oh, my sleeves are long. Okay, I thought you went like this. No. Okay. So until the meeting on the road to Damascus, this is how Paul would have interpreted it. We all would have interpreted it. People still interpret it this way. Dispensationalists interpret it this way. How would they consider themselves Christians? Oh, um, we're... Yeah, don't go down there. Ask George. In fact, that'll be my catchphrase from now on. Ask George. But really, ask George, because he'll give it to you in the nutshell version. We, Christians, are the parenthesis in the larger story of redemption. So we are in a period of time between promise and fulfillment, all of which belongs exclusively to the Jewish people. Okay, so all of those um, Isaiah prophecies and promises that we talk about so often, none of them are fulfilled. 
we're waiting for the fulfillment. That's too strong. Obviously, Isaiah 53 and so. But the land promises, the temple, the city, all of those things are still future. Because those were promises made to the Jewish people. Okay, so they're basically tracking with this, though in an adjusted way. Paul has reinterpreted it entirely. Okay, as a direct result of his encounter with Jesus, who was rather shockingly crucified, which I don't think anyone really expected for the Messiah. In fact, there's no real, real clear extra-biblical Jewish literature that has the Messiah dying as part of its belief. One might have thought they could have sensed in Isaiah 53 something going on there, but as far as I know, that's not what's going on. So the Messiah was crucified, resurrected, and then ascended into the heavenly realm. And when I did Pauline theology years and years ago, I actually started at the end of the story with Jesus at the right hand of God and ask the question, how did we get here? Why is this the end of the story? The Old Testament, had we read it like Paul read it, like it, like it seems to require that it be read, should have had the son of David in a restored Jerusalem, far eastern end of the Mediterranean, right, in all the quote, literal things going on, so that the right hand of God would have been in the city of God, next to the temple of God. So why is Jesus at the right hand of God and the right hand of God is in heaven? I remember when you asked this, and after a long silence, a lot of wrong answers came to Yeah. <laughs> it's just another way to get at it. Yeah. The story shouldn't have ended this way by a conventional reading of the text. And yet, Paul says, in effect, the story's over now because Jesus is at the right hand of God. Now, there's a lot of time between the uh, resurrection and ascension and his actual appearance, but the essence of the story is now complete. Now it's a matter of bringing in the nations to the kingdom of God. So Paul was forced to return to this so familiar story and reread it in light of how it ended. Um, the illustration I always use for this, because my imagination is stuck. How many of you have seen The Sixth Sense? Right? Sixth Sense, right? So, the statute of limitations is over. Bruce Willis is dead. That's the story. Mm -hmm. So when we watched it on home video, home video, literally the video cassette, we were shocked at the end. It really caught us off guard. What do you think we did the next night? Watched it again. We watched it again with new eyes. With new eyes. Same story. Ended, so now we need to go back and watch it. In a sense, that's what Paul did with the Bible. So now, the age to come has, in fact, arrived already. But in Paul's new interpretation, Abraham's family is not his genetic descendants, but those who have faith like his, whether they are Jew or Gentile. Abraham's land inheritance continues to remain an essential feature in the story, as we'll see in a moment, verse 18. For if the inheritance comes by namas, it, is no, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it. God gave it to Abraham by a promise. And the Torah, on the other hand, has served its intended purpose and is now dismissed from God's service, at least in its covenantal function. That's a, that's a, a crucial little caveat there, because we're talking about covenant administrations here. 
So it's now dismissed from God's service, and this coincides with the entrance of Gentiles into the church or the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit has arrived. He shook the Torah's hand, thanked it for a millennium of faithful service, insisted that it bears no blame for Israel's failure, that indeed it was serving the cause of Israel's failure, and then he retired it. So, in this retelling of the story, Paul did not go through the Torah with a red marker, crossing out some parts, namely those famous ceremonies that Protestants are always talking about, dispensing with those and then circling the parts that still continued on as God's perfect rule for righteousness. The Namas, as an administration of the Sinai Covenant, had a beginning and it had an end. And that's what Paul begins to defend in chapter 3, verses 15 through 18, where we are right now. Why are the promises made to Abraham taking precedent over the Sinai Covenant, which, again, in Paul's reading, fit a nice progressive story. First this, then this, then this. So it's sort of like we're moving onward and upward as we go from Genesis 12 through Genesis 15 through Genesis 17, Genesis 22, and then on, of course, to Egypt, the Exodus, and Exodus 19. Perfectly linear story. Progress in the history of redemption. Makes perfect sense. Here's Paul. And the text I have in front of me has a little bit of my editorial commenting. So let me stop here and just see if there are any questions. Again, I can always just fly. Is anyone lost? Bob, you don't have a question, do you? I do. Uh, you said that uh, Paul would have read the story uh, with an understanding of Israel in the Ancestry.com stance, but even in the old reading of the story, he would have allowed for converts to Judaism in Israel. Absolutely. Yep. Maybe there's even a little bit of a hint, and we'd have to read between the lines a bit, I suppose, that um, Paul's opponent in Galatia uh, may actually impute that to Paul, that in fact he is an observant Jew, and had he had his way and was not interested in making it's so easy for the Gentiles to become believers, he would, he would require the same thing. Because there's that place later in Galatians where he says, if I still, uh, how does he put it, if I still require circumcision, why am I being persecuted? So that's just a maybe, but no, I, I agree with you. So yes, converts, proselytes, whatever you want to call them, could have been included in that, but that would have meant that they would have become functionally Jews. Okay? So, seeing none, you can tell I've been to Presbytery, seeing none, objections, right? Okay. To give a human example, or as the old King James put it, I speak after the manner of men. Brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Right? Now the promises, and in my um, brackets I put, which were ratified in a covenant, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, 
but referring to one and to your offspring who is Christ. And so sort of taking that at face value, it sounds like Paul is saying God made his promises to Abraham and to his seed slash son, who is Jesus the Messiah. This is what I mean. Namas, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For, it's a supporting statement here, for if the inheritance comes by namas, then it is no longer, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it. It might even be possible to read it like God graciously gave it to Abraham by, by a promise. Now we can be sure that we're following Paul's point when we ask the inevitable question that in verse 19 he asks for us rhetorically and it's a question that you don't hear Reformed folk asking except when they get to Galatians 3.19. Why then the namas? Why then the namas? Translate that for me. What do I mean by why then the namas? And there is a the there. What was the purpose of the law? What's the point? Exactly. Why all this? Why all this? If it was all about Abraham all along, it's all about promise, it's all about blessing, it's all about faith, it's the gospel that was preached beforehand to Abraham, right? The, the, the promised Holy Spirit. All of these, what we'll call very positive expressions of the Christian religion, um, all originating in the God who loved us and gave his son for us, who ju even justifies us by our faith and not by the works that the law required. If it's that simple, Paul, what was the whole thing about the Sinai Covenant about anyway? Why even have 430 years later, which isn't quite accurate, but centuries after what you said to Abram and Ur of the Chaldees when you brought him, why all of this? Why not just go from Abraham right to Jesus? Are you ready to ask that question? Yeah. Okay. Now you know what the word law means. And if you know what the word law means, all the passages where we can't figure out why Paul seems to speak, and I stress this, seems to speak disparagingly about the law, makes sense. He's talking about the covenant God made at Sinai. So, later on, here's, here's a head scratcher, and it's right out of Galatians, so we can use it here. Um, mm -mm -mm. Good job, Jeff. You forgot where it was. Yeah, thank you. Who gave me the Homer Simpson? I think Bob did. It's where Paul... Yeah, here it is. Verse 18 in chapter 5. But if you were led by the Spirit, you were not under the law. Now, it's Romans that piles one of these up after another. What do you mean we're not under the law? And then the Protestant commentators rush in and say, well, he doesn't mean... He's not talking about the Ten Commandments. He's not talking about the law of God. He means the ceremonies. That's not what Paul's... And if you look at verse 17, 317, you now have the Rosetta Stone. <laughs> 
of what Paul means when he uses the word namas. It's the covenant that was made five centuries after the one he made with Abraham. That's what law is. It's a covenant administration. And as such, we're not talking about whether the, whether the actual words and legislation and wisdom and justice contained in the Torah are worthwhile. We're talking about when we look up, what do we see reigning over us? What is the instrument of God's rule over us? Do we look up and see a promise of blessing and a promise of curse? Or do we look up and see promise, blessing, justification by faith, and all the rest? That's the new covenant fulfilling the promise made to Abraham. And so when we get to chapter 4, what does Paul say? He will say, in fact, I'm going to read it to you, because even this is confusing to some Reformed people. When I learned that, I was actually quite shocked, because it seems so straightforward. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? This is 21. And then he goes and he tells the story of whom? Abraham. Abraham. Well, that's Genesis, right? That's one of the five books of Moses. And he talks about Abraham having two sons, one born of Hagar, a slave, and the other born of the free woman. And then he says this, these women are two covenants. Well, what could two covenants could those possibly be? The Abrahamic and the Sinai covenants. But that's next year. So stress, stress, stress. We're talking about a covenant administration that cannot provide life that offers no promises, that leaves the people of God under a curse, right? And all the other things that we've learned so far, just from Galatians chapter 3, and that in fact we needed to be redeemed from what that covenant actually produced in the people of God, namely the curse. That's why the Messiah had to be crucified. Because cursed is the man who hangs on a tree. So he himself bore the curse as part of bringing that covenant to an end to open the gates of blessing. Maybe there's a hymn in there somewhere, I don't know. So that even the Gentiles could, could bathe in the living water. Okay, so we're talking about covenants here. And once you get that straightened out, you don't have to worry about law-keeping as a way to earn God's favor. Well, if you do, that's up to you. But Paul's not talking about that in Galatians. Okay, so this huge wart in Reformed piety is actually removed simply by reading Galatians the right way. Doesn't mean people aren't feeling way down in their conscience or struggling. But in my critique of my own tradition, what happens inevitably, I've got a stack of articles. I'm keeping them for future re reference. Inevitably, the law that got kicked out the front door comes back in through the back door, back into the Christian life. And now we walk that tightrope, that frustrating, mental, discouraging tightrope where we keep the law, but we don't keep it to be justified, but we do keep it to learn to please God, but we're really justified by faith. But here's the law telling us and reminding us, how, but we got to keep it because this is what pleases. But we just, and Paul basically wipes that all away in Galatians because we never read Galatians covenantally, 
we read it rather in terms of um, the order of salvation. So sanctification includes the law, or as we call it, the moral law, the perfect rule of righteousness that was revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments. Okay? Does it? So, are we all together here? Because this is, this is what opens up Galatians and makes it meaningful. And I'll, I'll pause dramatically to see if there are any questions. You know, the um, desire in our tradition is to really protect God's reputation and all this. So, when in fact the answer is right there in the text, if they'll just embrace it. Yeah. Right? They want, their intentions are good, but. You know, look at Calvin. Calvin says in Galatians 3, it's not the moral law only, but of everything connected with the office held by Moses. Calvin is, on the one hand, right, but he still operates with this threefold division in the law as normative. And that's not normative. There is no ceremonial, moral, and civil law. There is simply the law. Israel didn't divide themselves up that way. This is something that creeped into the church as the church was developing its theology, and then it became... Uh, well, if the cement was wet, then it dried, and it's now a permanent possession of the church. But, it, but whenever I ask people, okay, where does it come from? No one can tell me. I'll ask you guys, where do we find in the Bible a threefold division of the law? Well, in the Hebrew manuscripts, the laws were written in three different colors. Oh, that's it, Bob. <laughs> See, if only I had access to those. Well, you know, there is an argument, and I've interacted with it, at least in my brain, that we take these various Hebrew words for, the, for Israel's legislation, like statute, command, law, ordinance. ordinance. Those all have different words. This originated with Aquinas, and each one of those words respect respectively refers to one of the divisions of the law but that doesn't work so it was just a roll of the dice and a little bit of scholasticism i suppose but it doesn't read the story correctly and if you went to a to a jewish person in the first century and said you know the circumcision thing you're doing that's just a ceremony well, people died for their ceremonies. They were martyred for their ceremonies. They didn't fight on the Sabbath and were massacred for their ceremonies. So it's, it's actually has a, a, a little bit anti-Semitic, maybe. It's certainly a patronizing view of Judaism. And it comes out of medieval theology. Okay? So. <gasps> yeah. Yes. Um, the thing that is bothering me, if, if Jesus died to take the curse that Israel was under because they were under the Nahas, then Jesus died for Israel. What need do anyone, do the nations have for Jesus' death? Why do, why do we need Jesus' death if we were never under the Nahas? Right. Can you repeat all? Oh, could you say that? I, I'll repeat the question. Okay. In other words, Jesus died for me. Yes, he did. Okay. The question is, if if the Namas is the covenant that's over Israel alone, and Jesus enters into that situation 
and takes the curse of the namas on himself, then it follows, doesn't it, that the Jewish people or the people under that covenant are redeemed from the curse dimension of the covenant. But the rest of us who are outside of Israel, how do, how do we fit into that? Is that a pretty good um, paraphrase? Okay. Um, the answer is kind of long and complicated, and maybe I will take it on before we finish. But the short version is when we understand that Israel itself as a nation is the new Eden, and the people of Israel are the new Adam. And therefore, those that whole probationary and representative task that originally belonged to Adam has now, if you will, been resurrected and recreated in the context of Israel. So Israel is representing humanity as a whole. That's the very short version. And that has to do with what we saw at the end of chapter 2, the what we call incorporative theology. And I'm actually going to touch on that a little bit toward the end of this lesson. So, why then the namas? That's the question you should ask. And it's the exact question that Paul asks and answers beginning in verse 19. But we're not, that'll be next week. Anyway, I put these texts in the handout just as the relevant Old Testament background texts. Um, Genesis 13, 15, 17, 24, etc. That's the background for what Paul's describing in 3, 15 through 17. But what about this whole seed seeds thing? Verse 16. Anyone buying that? Oh, you're all buying it? Okay. Jeff. Even Calvin writes about this. He says the Jews in his day seize on verse 16 in chapter 3 to say, you guys have no argument. And Calvin's frustrated with the Christians who won't answer that attack. Um, so this has always been something of a an apparent weak point. How many of us regularly talk about seed and seeds and make a, a crucial redemptive historical decision based on singular versus plural? Okay, go ahead, Ron. Sorry. I was going to ask the same thing about offspring because in English that can be singular or plural. That, in that's Hebrew, is it, In Hebrew, is it uh, singular or plural in that one word? The word beneath offspring is sperma or seed. And that's how the older translations translated it. We don't typically refer to our children as our seed anymore, right? How many of you actually think of your children as you say, they're, they're my seed or seeds, right? So the modern versions update it to offspring because it does the exact same thing. It's a collective noun, right? Doug, do you have offspring? I do. One or three or three, right? Yeah. You don't say offsprings right. unless you don't know English grammar very well, right? I have four offspring. Carrie, you have three. Bob, you have two. You guys have four? Only six. Only six. Yes. Six. But you don't say, here are my offsprings, right? So, so when, you're right, seed would be better. Yeah, and it's, but it still has that same problem. I even did a search today on the Greek word seeds in the whole Greek Bible, and it hardly ever appears. In fact, I could count on one hand. But the word seed appears numerous amounts of time. 
Yeah, but you don't go to your, you don't say, I'm going to go to the garden and plant seed or a seed. Right. You're going to plant seeds. Uh, you can say either one. Yeah, you can say seed. Like Jesus says that the, um, the uh, what's the tree with the, the mustard? It's the smallest of the seeds. I think that's one of the plurals. But they're like I said. What's that? A farmer went out to sow his seed. You know, I have to go back and check that because I'm not sure if the word seeds is actually there or not. So, in the original, that is. But those were some that came up when I did an English search. The parable of the sower. Even with the parable of the sower, we still have no more than five or six total. That includes the Old Testament. And so, here's Paul. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is, Christ. Well then, this is... It's not something you'd like to be asked if you were witnessing out on the street one day and you weren't prepared for it. So the typical way to explain what to us seems like hmm, an unusual way to argue is to point to methods employed by Jewish writers and interpreters from Second Temple period in the ancient world where, in fact, they have some novel ways of arguing from the biblical text that they accept as authoritative, right? Even if we would go, eh. My favorite one, of course, is Melchizedek in Hebrews, right? Melchizedek has no parents. He just shows up on the scene and then disappears. And the author of Hebrews says See, he's an everlasting priesthood. Um, he has no beginning and no end. You know, well, no, he just actually showed up in chapter 14 and then went back home. So, it, you know, I'd get an F on my paper if I did that, but the author of Hebrews is inspired. But it is interesting, and here is a passage from a book called Jubilees, where, in fact, the distinction between seed as a collective plural and seed as a singular is in fact made. And this is from the second century BC. So there's no Christian interpolation going on here. And it's basically a retelling, interestingly, of the Genesis story. And we returned in the seventh month and found Sarah with child before us. And we blessed him and we announced to him all the things which had been decreed concerning him that he should not die till he should beget six sons more and should see them before he died, but that in Isaac should his name and seed be called, and that all the seed of his son should be Gentiles and be reckoned with the Gentiles, but from the sons of Isaac, one should become a holy seed and should not be reckoned among the Gentiles. For he should become the portion of the Most High, and all his seed had fallen into the possession of God, etc. I'm not interested at all in the theology as much as I am in a Jewish way of distinguishing between a singular and a plural in one sort of corporate entity. So most of the explanations about what seems rather odd in Galatians 3.16 build on the way that the Old Testament distinguishes between seed and seeds. Not that it uses the plural, but that it can talk about a collective plural that ultimately finds its fulfillment in an individual, okay? And a classic example of that might be the very first seed, the seed of the serpent versus the seed of the woman. Now, in some way, I think according to 1 John, 
that re represents sort of the Cain and Abel lines in the world, which divide nicely into light and darkness and why there is hostility between them. But he can go on to say, that is, Genesis can, can go on to say, and he will bruise your heel and he will crush your head. I switched it. But it seems to revert to a singular seed, that there is whatever's going on in this pool of people, we'll call them seeds for the sake of the argument, will reach a, a culminating point in a conflict between seed and seed, person against person. However, recently I've read N.T. Wright on this view, and he proposed a fairly straightforward explanation that cuts through the many chords of these kind of complex seed arguments. Um, he points out that the word seed does not in fact refer to one person, Jesus, despite what the text seems to say. And when I read it to you, I put it that way, right? I even said it seems to speak to Abraham and a single seed, Jesus. Rather, says Wright, it refers to one family, namely the Messiah and his people. So in this reading, and I'll now promises, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his seed, that is to his family, not more than one family, a single family. But the text says, it does not say seeds, it refers to one who is Christ. And so Wright says, the seed there is the Messiah and his people. So it takes the title Christ in a collective sense, so that Christ stands for the one singular messianic family. Okay. Now, I would feel a little cautious about that interpretation if it weren't for how chapter, 20, or chapter 3 ends. But now that faith has come, verse 25, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. That is the one family. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That is incorporative language, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. So there, of course, he's got a collective understanding of seed, right? He's talking to all kinds of Christians. But nevertheless, the idea that they're all one in Christ gives them a single identity as Abraham's family. So I think that's an interesting argument. And I really have very little to say about it. And you can read, if you care to, um, whatever else I said about seed. Any questions? We're going to be just finishing up here, staying on track. Sorry? I'll ask George. Oh, no, I'm just, I'm just yeah, ask George. It's interesting, we had a, a little discussion in Presbytery. It was off the record, but there's a new paragraph in the Book of Church Order that refers to Christian people, specifically people who are aspiring to offices, and calls them uh, new creations, lowercase n, lowercase c, plural. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I don't want that in my denomination's book of church order because there's no such thing as 
new creations any more than there is new heavens and new earths. That's creation, the heavens and the earth. The new creation is the new heavens and earth, but it's a whole creation. But this gets at the problem of the conventional reading of the order of salvation. Um, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, says many of the old, uh, many of the older versions, he is a new creation. Little n, little c. All, the old has passed away; the new has come. So we read that as a matter of private Christianity. It's part of my conversion experience that now I'm a new creation and Fernanda you're a new creation and Emily you are and Jean you're a new creation. But the text says if anyone is in Christ Jesus new creation. Isaiah 63 right? Then the old has passed away the new has come that's Isaiah 48 I think. So the whole thing is talking about what new creation is even at the end of Galatians. Circumcision and uncircumcision don't matter anything more. The only thing that matters is new creation. Okay, So now we're up here looking at it redemptive historically, not my personal salvation experience where the evangelist says, Kara, if you accept Christ, you'll be a new creature. Or that's King James. No, no, no. There's a, there's a big story going on here. We are part of the new creation when we're incorporated into Christ. And some of the newer translations actually preserve that. So that's, that illustrates a mental block that we have that I hope Galatians 3, 15 through 18 can sort of dent because the passage is crucial to the overall argument in Galatians. For one, it identifies clearly what Paul means by the law. When you read your English versions, what I've been calling the namas. It is a covenant that God made with Israel at Mount Sinai. This means that Paul's overall argument depends on the relationship between two Old Testament covenants, one made with Abraham and one made with Israel through a mediator. I'm anticipating next time. So all, even in that language, Paul is kind of saying, don't you see this is a little bit of an inferior sort of covenant because there is no mediator in the covenant that God makes with Abraham, right? This confirms what I've been arguing all along. Galatians is not first and foremost about two ways of obtaining salvation, either by grace through faith or law keeping as an expression of self-effort in order to gain merit. It's about who can be God's people in Abraham's family Answering the question, must a Gentile become Torah observant and a Torah observant convert to Judaism? Or did Torah observance come to an end with that covenant? And I'll give David the last word. Even before Paul discusses what the purpose of the Namas is, 319, he declares what its purpose is not. Its purpose is not to alter, modify, or annul the Abrahamic covenant in any manner whatsoever. At first, this seems like a counterintuitive way to read the Old Testament, but in light of Jesus' death and resurrection, it's the way that actually makes sense of the Old Testament and God's plan to have one grand worldwide family um, in Christ. So the, the addition of the Gentiles is not a new development. It was in the story from the very start, from the opening words.
And when, by the way, does, does the promise come to Abraham? First, first time. Genesis 12, right? What comes before Genesis 12? Yeah, Babel, when the nations are dispersed from the center. So in that sense, a careful reader might think that the solution to the dispersion of the nations and the confusion of their language is a man, an old man from, the, from Ur of the Chaldees. Cool. I think that's cool. It is cool. Just think of how Paul, after that encounter on Damascus Road, night after night, he was laid in his bed just rehearsing, going back over constantly, you know? Well, at one point, remember in his, his autobiography here, he kind of disappears for a little bit, right? Yeah. Um, but I went away into Arabia. However long he was there. I was going to ask if we knew what, how long. Yeah. Years. That's what I've, that's the typical time frame I've heard. And I'm not sure if it's because of verse 18. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem. In other words, after three years in Arabia or after three years from his conversion. I don't know. But the point is, here was this this the the best theologian that um uh Gamaliel produced right first in his class and he's the one that Jesus nabs and says from the start you're going to be the missionary to the gentiles the one who is with the, with the writ of arrest going to Damascus to arrest Jewish Christians and he gets stopped there. So that's it for this evening. Any questions from our viewers at home? All right, then I'm shutting you down. Over and out. Good night, everybody.